Dan Bricklin was the father of the desktop spreadsheet, and Bob says he's the mother. That's, <laughs> so, that's what he said. I'm quoting the man. Um, so, I, I mean, I don't think anyone would say VisiCalc was the first spreadsheet. Flat out wouldn't really be a fair statement. Well, it was the first electronic. Right. Um, and there were, you know, four microcomputers. There might have been for, you know. um, but before VisiCalc, desktop computers, especially in large businesses, were seen as toys. Real computers were made out of metal, right? Um, and VisiCalc changed all that, and suddenly everyone wanted an Apple II at work. So I'm going to let him pick up the rest of the story. Okay, let's see how to use this microphone. These newfangled things. Um, I didn't put together a, a, a talk as such, but a lot of it's a question of you know, what the audience is and what you want to hear. So I'm going to start out answering a question about whether it was the first spreadsheet. Uh, and the, the short answer is yes. But the question is, what do you mean by spreadsheet? Because obviously, people were drawing things on backs of the envelope. And that was really the design point. That um, you know, pe before that, people did have a lot of programming tools to do grids of numbers, calculations. As a matter of fact, um, it, it, it's fun to ask people uh, what year I think it was. My first real job was helping to program an, uh, what is called first financial language, which was basically an online service for uh, stock analysts to do analysis. And you would do rows and columns. You put GM down, cross sales, maybe year 66. Anybody want to guess what year that was? Someone didn't listen. 63. Uh, 66. And that was, I think, one of the first online services at all in those days. Uh, and so the, uh, um, and you know, trying to get a sense. That was sort of my introduction to personal computing. I mean, we were well, actually we, computers were personal, in, you know, in the 1950s because you would have to use the computer yourself. You would take turns, or you'd give these things to the operator to run jobs. So you lost this personal touch as you know computers became too expensive. Uh, but that experience. Um, with the 940, with this, the SDS 940 was valuable because, uh, you know, by 966 I had a terminal home and it was used to personal computing. So, you know, you like to think the sort of romantic story of VisiCalc, these kids out of nowhere in the garage did this program and it worked. Well, you know, I'd been programming since 1963 and Dan was since the 1960s, so we're used to computers by then. And we also we used to screens and, and interactive systems because you know it, it's interesting if you talk to a lot of people then you know the punch cards were still the dominant theme of computers even until the 1970s um, but we were used to online systems how many of you people have heard of the Multics project at MIT okay good so. Um, well, yeah, I was about to say, Sir Kern had mentioned that yesterday because well, there's a lot of shared background. Um, and these guys in New Jersey just couldn't keep their budget line items in, so they sort of got cut off by the project and then had to feed their addiction. Uh, but those experiences, and also um, Dan um, worked at DEC, so he did this word, one of the early word pro screen based word processors for DEC, uh, WIPS 8. And how many of you have heard of Emacs? OK. <laughs> so by the way, there's another talk I can give about the history of Emacs, if you want, because that uh, Emacs is the name of a macro package, not the editor. Um, but you know, again, each of the story. But I, you know, so we used to very interactive computing then. Matter of fact, in 1966, I remember visiting and seeing the IBM 2250. There was a remote interactive screen with graphics and the sketch pad. So there are a lot of these ideas going around. But what was missing was a sense of sort of wig for math. And this gets back to the question, what's the first spreadsheet? That um, there was the interactivity, the ability to type a number 
And we always use the word redisplay because the idea wasn't that this is your first, you know, time displaying it. That wasn't the product. It was a redisplay, the recalculation that was the key. So, um, and Dan can tell you more of the story about being in class. And, you know, you look at the spreadsheet, the paper spreadsheet, and trying to figure out, you know, okay, I got to erase numbers, recalculate, rewrite this. Now, I mentioned that there were these time series programs, things, but they all had regular computing. You had time series, you intersect things. But there wasn't the tech, essentially the capability for just working with numbers very fluidly. And that was the real thing where you can type something into a cell and it would recalculate as you watched it. Uh, now, I remember, you know, again, another thing we had in the 70s was, you know, heads-up displays existed, graphics. Is, how many of you have heard of the Media Lab at MIT? Those days, it was the architectural machine group. And, there were, you know, spatial data management systems. So those ideas are there. So when Dan first described the idea to me, was I was thinking of the board, you're sitting all around a desk in a boardroom, you're pointing to the common screen, you got the math equations, the graphics and all this, or so pointing and changing things. Now, the ideas are there. It might have been a little hard to do on the Apple II, but the real breakthrough, this was Dan's, is to take just the grid, drop out the graphics, and the nice thing about a grid is if you could point to that cell, so you, you could do a calculation, in this cell, then imagine with your finger, you could just point to say that cell, you didn't have to name it, didn't have to do anything complicated, and remember what you did. So it was that ability to work with it. We, t we actually dropped a sort of all this computer science stuff we knew um, about how to sort of have dependency chains and all this fancy stuff, how to sort of keep the equations there like those maxima. The trick was to forget all that. Put that aside and make it very simple for people so it could be sort of work. Think of it basically all that work you did with the calculator for each cell, it remember how you did it so you could replay it. So, in effect, and I, expl I mentioned this in the talk it gave, uh, 1969, 79, sorry, uh, at the uh, fall joint, no, spring joint computer co conference or, well, whatever the name was, it might have been the NCC by then, uh, about how basically we're giving everybody the ability to program. And I use the analogy that uh, in the 1930s, the phone companies figured out that by the 1950s, everybody was going to have to be a phone operator in order to operate the phone system. And, how many, and by the 1950s, how many people are phone operators? Everybody. They just made it easy enough to operate the phone by dialing. <laughs> so in a sense, a lot of it is you empower people, you give them the tools. And this is what I did when I was at MIT. I helped co-found uh, something called the Student Information Processing Board, which was to give students access, and some of the members are here, at least one of them, <laughs> um, to give people access to, to the same power of computers that you know, I had, had myself. Um, so this is, that was why VisiCalc fits so well. It wasn't we were trying to create one-off solutions. Dan and I first met back in 1970 at MIT and figured, you know, one day we start a company and this is part of the spirit of creating tools to empower people, not just give them sort of one-off solutions. Um, so, but the problem is Dan, Dan doesn't do things halfway. Like, if he saw the future, you know, no future program, he has to learn how to become a manager. So, if you want to learn to become a manager, how do you do it? You go to Harvard uh, Business School. Nothing in the middle. Uh, which meant he was too busy, so he asked me to do the programming. And uh, I, that job I had in 1966, I still had. But the nice thing was, I could work what I wanted to, not, um, you know, so it, it helped pay, pay, working part time paid my way through MIT. College was a little cheaper in those days. <laughs> or programming paid very well, you could look at it either way. Um, and, the, you know, and that's, again, I could get off track and talk. So you look at these personal computers as the start of things. I view them as, oh, those are the brand new machines. 
uh, because the, the um, you know, so I could talk about it, like the 940 we use is also be, uh, became the basis for this thing everybody ever heard of called the ARPANET? Yes. <laughs> okay, that was why the ARPANET was created. So the all the industry was very, very small in those days. So that's why the Unix project came off the Multics project, but so much comes back to there. So um, let me jump a little. Well, I'm trying to think of how much do you want to hear about sort of the sort of the high uh, ideas of the spreadsheet, how it worked, all the design things, or I can jump to the programming part for a little while, and why the Apple II. Um, so while Dan was in business school, there was another kid starting a company called Personal Software, Dan F uh, Filestra. And he was doing cassette tapes. His big thing was cassette tapes uh, for personal computers. And, and that was mainly in those days, the Apple II, and I guess the, the PET was there, and uh, the TRS-80. So uh, I was already programming at a company called ECD. Now ECD made capacitance meters. I should look at the time at some point. Uh, ECD made these things called capacitance meters. Um, and if you're double E's, they were, they think, this is in the 70s when that was a big thing to get a thing with an LCD screen that can measure, measure capacitance. Uh, and they decided, like any company, what do we do next? So one of the students uh, at MIT, Spencer Love, said, let's do a personal computer. And there was a 6502, this great chip Chuck Peddle did. And, but, they, but again, this is MIT. They were, gonna, were not gonna do things halfway. So anybody ever hear of the ECD Micromind? Ah, oh, amazing. Okay, this is a 6502 based machine that can support multiple processors up to 16 megabytes of memory, uh, background I.O., the cassette tape would run in the background, multiprocessing, all this kind of stuff. So uh, I basically was writing a basic for it. I, I got into writing these basic like things. I wrote one on Multics where any student could walk up, no sign in, just started programming. Uh, so I did a basic for the MicroMind and got very good at the 6502 which is fortunate. <laughs> I do remember somebody bringing this toy computer called the Apple II, um, and it, I didn't think much of it, you know, especially about the MicroMind. Um, the MicroMind did have one slight design flaw. In business, you're supposed to sell things for more than it costs you to make it. <laughs> But you know, you got a fancy machine. It's competing against the Apple II in the market. You had, couldn't charge as much as it costs. Uh, so that failed, but um, it was useful because we had tools on, on Multics, the same, that same Multics machine, um, for assembler. And uh, one of the guys, John Doyle, did this nice assembly language, uh, which gave me the power to do code basically without go to's and things like that because. Uh, instead of um, go-tos, you could just do structured code. You have, you know, if, if, then, else, even assembly language by using macros and subroutine calls. So when it came time to visit Calc, we already had the tools for that. And also, you know, 652 was so simple, like at ECD days. Um, the only computer we ha had in those days was in New York for a show. And I had a bug in my basic. Uh, it wasn't really compiled as an interpreter. So I wrote a 6502 emulator that evening, tested the code out, code worked, sent it to New York, and the code worked. Uh, so 60, it was a very nice machine. Um, so, uh, um, so it all came together with the Apple II. So the first job I had uh, was, tr was actually um, the... the we tried to sell a basic to TI, but they didn't buy it. This is for the TI-99.4. So I had to convert a bridge program in basic from the TRS-80 to the Apple II. Now, the, we had a problem that weekend. They didn't have a printer. So you need to get a listing of code, and you have a printer. The obvious solution was get your SX-70 Polaroid camera out and take a picture of each screen. So I had to pile this thick. <laughs> 
of, of, of Polaroid shots of screens. And from that, I converted the basic program to the Apple II. And that gave me some practice. But yeah, you know, it, it, this is the spirit. You have to, you know, you work with what you have. Uh, so Dan had this idea he was playing with, and what he did was he mocked it up on the Apple II. Basically, w originally, you, it turns out by the way, uh, the paddles are not very good for precise positioning, so I ended up using the arrow keys. And began, and the real breakthrough was the simplicity, getting rid of all those graphics and all those ideas have a very simple grid, and we had to sell it to Dan Foster. It could be a checkbook program. You know, it was a very general purpose tool, but we had to tell a story about the one application for it. And one of the things that bothers me about the apps today is they're two special purposes. Like people who do a mortgage program, they would do a program for each purpose. And the idea of doing very general purpose enabling technologies it's a much harder thing for people to sort of appreciate. And, you know, I guess it was a program experience, a thing, whatever, uh, that led us to sort of build a general purpose tool because you're working with numbers, which is sort of very generic. And it was actually very fortunate that we did that because if, let's say we wanted to do a good word processor, it would have, there's too, there, there are too many different functions. The nice thing about numbers is they're simple. And we can cheat because it was the art of illusion. We, had, we recognized then we were not just doing a program. We were creating a product. And anything you did to make the product work, we had to do. Uh, so the goal was to maintain the illusion that people were working with the numbers on the screen. And we were successful if, if it disappeared. If people didn't realize they were working with the computer, we succeeded. Um, and for and now, of course, programmers didn't understand it at all. But accountants, you know, it, 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 if I wanted to, I could have created a cult for accountants. <laughs> um, now, of course, we had a discussion earlier. The smart ones realized they shouldn't tell the clients about it, but say, "Oh, I spent the last three weeks working on your calculation when they're really on vacation." Um, so, and it was also, I mean, fortunate timing because those people, people with money happen to have money. So they also helped fund the industry. We, try, we charge a VisiCalc on the assumption was, well, let's see, they could sell um, a chess program for $35. Maybe we could charge a little more for a calculation program. You know, little did we realize that the, for the people we were selling to, that it was this is a petty cash expenditure. Now, it was fortunate we charged, I mean, it's interesting, you know, all sorts of things about economics, but the effect was increased, was, it was accessible to anybody with a computer. So it wasn't, the original, we were originally thinking of using a PDP-11 inside a VT-100 box. How many of you know the VT-100? Okay. Did you ever wonder why there was a finger shredding thing on the side? It, you know, I don't know how many people, but VT100s came with a finger shredder. There's a little serrated edge on the side. If you lift it up wrong, your finger would get cut off. Okay. The idea is you're supposed to put a PDP-11 inside of it. That was the idea. So that in the printer, you have a self-contained personal computer. Uh, and for, and we, so the original thing we were thinking of going for boardrooms, a friend of mine was a product manager with it, but fortunately we went with the Apple II, we charged a low price, which made it more available to everybody, even if we sort of left money on the table. What was the introductory price? Uh, good question. I think it came out at 100 We were negotiated based on a $35 price for the, for the publisher-author deal, which had all sorts of consequences. All these things have consequences, but I think it came out about $100. Did, did you figure it out using VisiCalc? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, uh, <laughs> we very much, it was a very simple calculation. <laughs> but actually, one side thing, um, I mean, we wound up getting into lawsuits about it because, uh, uh, let's see, what's a nice way to put it about the people on the West Coast? But what should have been a simple business negotiation didn't go well. But uh, the contract, you might appreciate, we negotiated when the lawsuit came. 
uh, we had to produce a copy of the contract, and they couldn't find it. Fortunately, I had a copy done. I made a copy using the copier I had at home. So this was 1979, and I had a home copier. Do you know what a home copier was like in those days? It was a basically a piece of plastic with a light bulb and your thermal sensitive paper. <laughs> you looked amazed, yes. That was a copy in those days. <laughs> it was a, but this was not but it was a thermofax paper using a Radio Shack cheap thing. We didn't have the fancy thermofax thing which would fed it through. This you just put the piece of paper on, you had a light bulb inside. <laughs> No, the copies were correct. Uh, it, it, no, I think it was. I think it was. The, the, well, it depends on the, the chemicals used, but that was the copy we had. That was again. You know, it, you think back. I mean, there was a mixture because computer. We had a lot of the technology, but computers are expensive. So you know, the things you did manually, things you did. Like I had a, the terminal at home, and I got some of the pictures of it. Was a deck, um, LA one twenty. I think it was the deck, writer. deck writer, deck writer 120, LW, whatever the number was, 120 CPS, blindingly fast, 120 characters per second. I could imagine something went that fast because my, well, it was going, well, in 66, I got, I first, when I first started working at home, uh, I still have the acoustic coupler from those days. And that went to 10 characters a second. And do you know what it costs to do a phone call across the country to do a listing? <laughs> uh, my first phone bill as a student, this is a very disorganized talk, but what the hell, uh, was, this is $1967, the one I remember, I, was, I didn't see the bills for the, for the ones I had when it was the first year I spent at Stony Brook, was I think it was $1,200 for my phone bill. <laughs> the, and now, this is what, a factor of 10 inflation since? If phone calls are expensive, listings were slow. I spent all my time in class with a colored pen mocking up. By the way, one other thing. The, the guy who designed that FFL, anybody here, Butler Lampson? Yeah. Yeah, he was the guy who designed that F <laughs> So they're all, again, there's a small industry at the time. So let's, um, let me jump ahead to sort of the, the, now the very nerdy, geeky part, which is the programming part of Visicalc. These programmers from France programming this thing called Ada. <laughs> so Visicalc and Ada are on the same computer at the same time. So how many of you know what Ada? The language, not the person. <laughs> so these, well, so these are the, the the two competing. Which one do you think? <laughs> well, does the military still use Ada? A Ada was a language designed so all you needed was a fifth grade education to program things to blow up the world. <laughs> yes. And <laughs> I've since met the designer, <laughs> spoke to him about you know, the differences. But uh, so, and, you know, I was still had some work in interactive data. They wanted me to go class. So I remember sitting in some of the sort of they were trying uh, coming to class. I forgot what the topic was, but I sit there designing. Okay, how do I compress an compress an expression to fit in memory? Because um, again, computers are going up to a 16 gigabytes becoming common now. So I have to keep remembering this is 16k. Uh, how many of you know how small 16K is? <laughs> how, many, how many of you have a thumbnail that's smaller than 16K? <laughs> but, um, you know, I do, you know and I, I'd also been used to Multics, where you just write code, you don't worry about the size of it, because that machine, the early Multics machine had a megabyte. And I think later we had even more. Well, the, the, well, the meg, uh, the, we had paging again. The 940, 940 had 192k, and now normalized. Well, actually, was that words or bytes? I think normalizing. Uh, those are three uh, twenty-four bit words. Multics had thirty-six bit words, but basically came out to about the original Multics in nineteen seventy was a megabyte, and that was aimed at twenty users on one machine. I mean, those are the ratios we had. Um, so, six, so people were surprised I could write small code. 
that wasn't my reputation, but you know, you do what you had to. So the goal was to do VisiCalc in a 16K machine. Um, yes, so I failed. It took 32K to, get, to have a workable spreadsheet. And so I worked out some of the ideas, but uh, you know, in the Multix days, um, I remember sitting in a terminal. Those days, you draw flow charts, you'd write code out by hand, and you know, being online those days, what am I writing this by hand? One, I just start to code, and developed a style where you start to flesh out the code. You write subroutines, you expand on it, and the code itself became its prototype. Uh, and it's sort of, I call it kneading code, K-N-E-A-D, code. Uh, but you, ha so you had to program it, not bottom up, I think, you had to have a sense of the structure and architecture of the code, but then you could sort of, it's like you're building a building, you might build a skeleton and then you start fleshing it out. And part of the goal is, to is the sooner it had the functionality, the sooner you understand what, understood what you were doing. So, um, and then you can learn by doing that. This worked very well with VisiCalc. Uh, I started programming thing, and I had to also start spreadsheet in it. So the main program forever on was called SS in it, and that evolved into the whole program. She makes me think of I remember eating tea in this if you eat tea in China, this chrysanthemum tea, which glow, you pour the hot water in, it expands out. Um, so very early, it would start to exhibit the initial functionality. You could start to see the grids and the lines. And, and fortunately, one thing, important thing is having Dan and I work together is Dan could have programmed it. And I also appreciate the business aspects. So we overlap, which meant when I was coding it, we could negotiate. In other words, so I would say, ah, I don't want to do that. But he, he, but I'd appreciate the reason for doing it, and he would also appreciate the programming trade-offs I was making. So he would play with screen layouts. Like initially, we had the commands at the bottom. We moved the grid. So he came up with these sort of the familiar bars at the top uh, design because he was able to play with it, do prototyping, and then I was able to modify the code. One of the early things we had in the code was the ability to relabel rows and columns. And that stayed in the code. I just explicitly put a check in to make sure it couldn't go in there because we figured out it would cause more grief by having people not see the A and the 1. We decided to put the letters down, letters across and the rows down because there could be a lot more rows than letters across. We had a design decision like make sure it could support up to 53 weeks for the extra year so you can do, you know, Spread, uh, spreadsheets in the back of the envelope. Have you, well, people, any of you ever used spreadsheets in the old days where you do a business chart, you do it across? I used, I used the widest uh, ledger sheets you could buy. Yes. Uh, we also, that, and Cal Cal Electro Ledger is one of the names we considered. But I always thought, again, very fine point for your accountants, that the ledger sheets had those colored lines down for dollars and cents, and this is a more general spreadsheet. Uh, but or as I, uh, I decided to call it a visible calculator. So each of these decisions we're able to make and work on because we, you know, now Dan was able to first play with the prototype, but we also had working code. So uh, I started programming it in November 1978. By January 1979, early, uh, it was already doing some calculations. Dan was able to use it in class. And one of the stories he tells is, uh, well, first it was used for the Pepsi challenge. Now, does anybody here know the connection between Pepsi and Apple? Yeah, Steve Markle. No, John Scully. Oh, John Scully. John Scully. And years later, I had a chance to tell this to John Scully. So John Scully was running the Pepsi challenge, <laughs> which it, it, it indirectly helped Ryan get him his job at Apple. <laughs> Um, but but we, I did have division working. So the professor's really impressed that Dan didn't use a shortcut with division, but he did the full calculation. <laughs> Dan couldn't tell him why. 
Um, so, and it was only integers. So it was that, uh, you know, getting each element to work along the way that's a very important part of the programming. But it was so, and the fact that I was doing an assembly was not by choice because back, you know, when I was at Interactive Data, which is a spin off of the White Well Group Finance that was, did the 940 project, everybody was still programming an assembler, none of that crap. I'd program in PL1 and sometimes BCPL, and you heard about BCPL yesterday, uh, which is a great language, um, which is basic CPL, but again, we can get off on that part too. Uh, but I was, would always use the highest level language I could. I'd only use a semi language if I had to. Um, and those days, by the way, semi language is still usable. When I look at the manuals today, I don't want to, you know, but that's another story. Uh, so, you know, I would use assembly language for VisiCalc because the 6502 was a byte machine and you would do all these kind of programming tricks which would make a difference. Because again, remember, 16K was the goal. So, for example, uh, now, how many of you program do programming? Okay, so I can get as geeky as I want on this. How many, actually, how many of you do assembly language? Okay, great for this crowd because, uh, I don't, you know, I try to use the highest abstractions I can when programming, but it really helps to know how to go, you know, lift that. I haven't lifted a soldering iron in a long time, but it helps to know at least what a soldering iron does. So you can wire the bits, you go to all these levels, so you choose what level you want. So the 6502, again, we didn't have, was 16, not just 16K, but it was a bike machine. So if you want, so one of the tricks is I had the loops go down. That would save one byte at the, for loop testing at the end of the loop. You would do parallel arrays so you didn't have to sort of double the index, but you would have one byte here and one byte in that array. So there are all these kind of programming tricks I do because every byte mattered. Uh, we. I designed a help system, an estimator would take 2K. That was too big. So I had to drop out the interactive help system. Um, in order to save things, when we saved the spreadsheet, I would save it using the, sa the same keystrokes that you type it in. But I also wanted to make it readable, so I allowed colon to act as a return. So if you actually printed out the save format, it was readable. But th there was a problem in the allocation. Like if you started, brought it back in from the upper left, going down, it would do a lot of allocates. So I'd save it for the lower right. So it uh, allocate the maximum extent first, and that would be much faster because it was very important to be able to read it in quickly because the original was just, we could save on cassette. Now the Apple cassette had no motor control. So you had to process it as the cassette was coming in. You couldn't stop and wait. So I had to do all this as, you know, as fast as we could bring the thing in. So the, this was what it was like, all these little considerations. You know, Dan's thing was a little bent, so it made it easy to use a slash key. Uh, to use commands and remind me, even today, if you type slash in Excel, you still use physical commands. <laughs> Some things never die. Um, and and you, it turns out using the arrow keys rather than the, the uh, uh, paddles or the joysticks was fortunate because you didn't remove your finger from the keyboard. And this is the same as the Emacs principle. Once you move your finger from the keyboard, you, you, you lose a lot of time. So you really want to be able to move around quickly. There was only two arrow keys. So you had to use a space bar. So all these fine little distinctions. One thing, any time, there was also no interrupts. Was well, just didn't do interrupts. Uh, so in every tight loop, I would have to program a keyboard check. Every time there was a loop, I program a key, check, is there anything for the keyboard? I'd also limit how much buffering I could take from the keyboard. So if you held the key down and repeated, it wouldn't scoot off to the side. 
all these little design considerations. Again, this is what happens when you have people who've been programming for like 15 years before, we're very aware of all these little fine points in design. I think this contributed to the success. And what's surprising is when people try to copy PhysiCalc, how often they would not know this. Uh, one of the things I got angry at Dan for was when SuperCalc, how many of you know about SuperCalc was one of the competitors? They didn't have arrow keys. And Dan said, what about the arrow keys? I, it was too late. He already, he already gave us an idea. <laughs> But when I, when, I t when I went on vacation, I had an Osborne, so I, had to, I didn't have much of a choice. But there was a physical, by the way, for CPM. How many of you even knew that? There are a couple of CPM machines, uh, one of which was a Sony. Nobody knows about the Sony machine. Oh, you, ha oh, you have this? I supported it. Oh, you great. What about the Xerox A20? Oh, yeah. Okay, Xerox A20. And the HP Apollo. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. HP Apollo is a very interesting machine uh, because it had a separate display processor. So I'd write code to, to blow it into the display processor. I had fun doing it. But unfortunately, I couldn't tell HP the sad news that the same day they were going to announce, there was another company going to be making an announcement. No, IBM 5150. <laughs> kind of sort of overshadowed the Apollo announcement. <laughs> but um, now, by the way, the, you know, the Z80 version, getting, this is a totally non-order talk, but what the hell. Uh, the Z80 version was written by a very good programmer, Seth Steinberg, who was originally with the uh, basically what was the prototype of the Media Lab, the Architectural Machine Group. And he had come up with some great stuff. He did an operating system for the Interdata, a real-time operating system with a great philosophical thing called the bad luck fault. Because there's some things in the hardware occasionally get a fault you couldn't recover from. So the system would say bad luck fault. And I think this is a lesson for people in any case. But you know, but he was also, you know, was eagle is programming, so the Z80 version was very close to the 6502, the same comments and everything it matched. And then I wrote an assembler which would take the Z80 code and compile it to the 8088, 86 for, the, for um, the IBM PC. So it was a lot of reuse, and that was sort of the, um, you know, basically the original version of Physicalc, so we could maintain the code on multiple platforms and keep evolving it. Uh, we also, again, the, the relationship with personal software continued. We moved basically from my attic, attic in Arlington, Massachusetts, for those in Arlington, Massachusetts, into a basement at Lafayette Square in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Now, I bet you nobody knows where Lafayette Square is, even if you lived in Cambridge. Anybody? There's Main Street of Mass Ave. I mean, the basement, and we had all these worries, like, if you didn't remember to shut off the, the pipes, it would flood in a storm. So we learned about wet vax and things like that. <laughs> and then we, mo we moved to the 12th story of a building in Central Square, which is a great view of Cambridge. Um, but we also, in those days, you know, there were other companies. How many of you have heard of Dave Weiner? So he came and asked, should, should we work? I work with those guys, and that's where he, he got started, personal computers. But Infocom? So the, the Zork people, and the Zork people, by the way, came out of the Multics world. Elvez worked with the Dynamic Modeling Group. Anybody ever heard JCR Licklatter? So he was one of the people who worked with Infocom. <laughs> so all these people keep showing up again and again in, in various guises. Um, so. You know, that was basically, you know, the the, we, the original code of VisiCalc. Now, we, there were a lot of, you know, design decisions, sort of over-design, for example, fixed columns. So we're very concerned about performance, not just space. So I did, it really went to the screen directly. Didn't go through system calls or anything. Uh, and, and, you know, the and some of the code I'm not proud of, like for example, but I, I had a bug and number conversion. 
to do the screen. Now I can do things, I can fix the bug, or I can say, oh, I recognize that situation in the code, and quickly rewrite the code. You look at the screen buffer, if it looked wrong, you just rewrite it to what it was supposed to be. <laughs> You know, again, you do what you had to do. <laughs> um, I, I view myself as a very pragmatic program. I like to think architecture, I like to think the high things, but ultimately it has to do what it has to do. Uh, I also, we also plan to put a transcendental function, sine, cosine, and things like that, but you know, it's a lot of work. Now, one of the design decisions we made was to use 12-digit decimal arithmetic because we were concerned about accountants who want the same kind of decimal errors they get with the calculator. That's also why there's no precedent in the calculations. If you type one plus two times three, it would give you nine, not seven. And because that's the way calculators had worked. We're trying to, now that was a bad design decision, but I'm proud of all my design decisions. Uh, and the other problem with transcendental functions is they were, uh, sorry, not transcendental, decimal arithmetic on the Apple II was slow. Nobody seemed to care that much, but later we discovered that nobody cares about precision. They drive that binary. Went through. But we, with transcendental functions are going to be a pain. So obviously we didn't, we're going to leave that out the first thing, except for Carl Helmers. How many of you know who Carl Helmers is? He was the editor of Byte Magazine, or wrote for Byte Magazine. He reviewed VisiCalc. He really liked the transcendental functions in his review. That created a problem. We had to put them in. <laughs> <laughs> so we'd sit there with the books and try to figure out, okay, how do you calculate this stuff properly, especially with decimal arithmetic? So sine and cosine, were, let's say, were not fast. But they did work. <laughs> and we also put in a graphics facility. Now, graphics in those days was you could calculate how many asterisks you want across the row. <laughs> did the 6502 have uh, Of course. Not, not in the hardware. <laughs> and as a matter of fact, uh, um, I shamelessly, um, when it was at ECD, wanted to use floating point, so I figured out Waz's floating point code. He did a nice job with the floating point code. <laughs> and, it, you know, there, if you did things right, with the, the proper ways of doing it and all this. Uh, speaking of which, actually, something. Uh, we did not want to sign the Apple II agreement to get source code, uh, <coughs> to, to get access to the operating system code. So instead, I reverse engineered Waz's uh, disk drive code. So we had our own code for the disk drives, which allowed us to do copy protection and things. So uh, the copy protection initially was to override, when you copied, we figured the first thing you do is test your copy. So we overrode the original tracks. And the problem we discovered is, you know, on the floppies, you have this write protect tab. It didn't always work. So people wondering why the disk would suddenly destroy themselves. But one of the consequences of doing our own file system was I forgot to reserve the bitmap. Which meant when you got halfway through your, your floppy, it would overwrite the bitmap. And yes, you'd lose your files about halfway through. Now, of course, professional people would know they should do a backup and save it twice. When you get a systemic error, that doesn't do you any good. <laughs> so it, it wasn't just, the, you know, we were just, especially I had to do the operating system, we had to do everything, and that all had to fit in 16K. That's why we failed and went to 32K. Now, later, um, there was uh, Pascal for the Apple uh, II, and, um, you know, UCSD Pascal, people familiar with that? Okay, they sold a lot of them, and and um, soft. Uh, no, what was the name? Uh, mm. Forgot the name. Soft Tech, I think it was called. Bought the company based on. It turns out, that what the deals were doing was, they'd get the Pascal, take the the extension board out of the box, and sell it as a VisiCalc board. <laughs> 
uh, so you can get a 64K um, VisiCalc machine. And get back to the original question, was this the first spreadsheet? It was that interactivity that was new. Uh, I, you know, like, I really like the idea, this is why I went to ECD, of you own your own computer. You could fry it, who cares? Matter of fact, uh, one thing I was I had to do was people used to plug in a thing and recognize the device, now plug and play. And that became a big thing was at Microsoft in the 90s, showing how to do it. But back on the Apple II, you had add-in boards. And if you printed to the disk drive, it would reboot. So I would go through and program each of these cards to recognize the signature. I'd figured, okay, look at these bytes and figure out what kind of card. Is this a printer? Is it a serial port? What is it? I also remember one night um, that there was an arc lamp in the room, a bright arc lamp. And then I realized, we don't have an arc lamp. <laughs> but the serial board did have a carbon resistor. <laughs> I say did in the past tense. <laughs> No, it's fun in those days, and we also, this is the day we started to port um, to the pet, and we had a kid, Brad Templeton, runs the FF now, he was the kid that came to help us port to the pet. It was a very small industry in those days. Um, so eventually we, um, you know, moved to, again, high quarters. We also wanted to do a higher level language. So it got uh, Seth Steinberg to do um, this Lisp-like language called IL for, uh, for the next version of VisiCalc. Um, and so that, that was sort of where we started to go to advanced VisiCalc in the next version. We were trying to shift to high level languages. The machines were not quite up, but we were very concerned about uh, you know, size and performance. Uh, but that was also, and since we're sort of, uh, oh, my watch is 90% of the time anymore. Uh, getting to the end, uh, things sort of fell apart. The, so, uh, sort of the publisher-author uh, relationship was not the right model for this. So, and, and they really uh, annoyed the product manager, Mitch Kapoor. You've heard of him? Yeah. So he ha had one exception in his non-compete. The program had to do spreadsheets, database, and word processing. And uh, and uh, I, we won't. Uh, this is polite company. I won't comment on the people at uh, the personal software who renamed themselves Visicorp. Uh, but they knew he couldn't do that, so they let him do it. But the thing is, Mitch is a nice guy. So wh when you know things fell apart, he did buy the assets, and I, then I w went to. Uh, Lotus, where he did an email product, uh, and continued to have fun. I mean, since then, there's, you know, I'm going to be giving a talk on Tuesday, and I don't know if there's time, people I need, might need to do rehearse on sort of the future stuff. I mean, this is all the past stuff, but these days I've been spending all more of my time on what is all this internet thing, and trying to explain that the internet itself is, is just a figment of our imagination and part of far larger ideas. So I don't know if there's time, but I might want to try beta run on that, sort of the roadshow version. But that's the future. But so um, I didn't leave much time for questions. But I guess he, uh, So you said you kind of um, built up a, a skeleton and then worked on so the yes. stuff. Did you guys keep uh, the, the source code like from various points along the way? Yeah, uh, somewhere. Uh, what we did was, so uh, at Software Arts, we bought, we bought a prime computer, which is sort of the closest thing to get to a Multics-like machine for an affordable price, because Honeywell had screwed up on Multics. The Unix people showed us computers should be cheap. So one of the things I did on Multics was bring in some of the Unix stuff of threads and stuff, multiprocessors and stuff, but Honeywell didn't get the message. Multics is supposed to be designed to be cost-reduced, a simplified version of Multics, uh, so it could be cheap. So instead, Prime made the closest thing to, was that machine, so we got Primes. So I re uh, one of the other projects I had to do was write all the tools, wrote an assembly line, assembler, all, all these other tools we had to build. You know, those funny days, you just did what you had to do. Um, 
So we wound up backing all that up on tapes. The Lotus lawyers said we need to hold on to these tapes for lawsuits and stuff. And I can't help but think of the, the first Indiana Jones movie where they store the, everything in the warehouse. Somewhere in the bowels of IBM is a source of VisiCalc. <laughs> so yes, we kept it, but I have no idea where it is. Did I, I just stepped out. Did you tell them the story about how we tried to get it back? Oh yeah, we tried to get it back. I thought, uh, I looked through all the floppies in my house. I created a machine to read five inch floppies. And the, the good news is floppies are amazingly resilient. The bad news is I couldn't find the source. Then I found some Bernoullis. Now Bernoullis was this 10 gigabyte, sorry, <laughs> 10 megabyte uh, floppies. And it turns out all I'd done, uh, you know, sorry, heroic thing, we found uh, somebody at PU who can read them and we then send them down to South Carolina to read the 20. Um, Bob contacted him March about a month or two ago, said he has these discs, can we read them for him? They might have a source. Um, so we contacted a March member up in Boston who had the tools to do them, plus one of his friends. First, we had to restore the drives. Got them all working, but it was just tools. Uh, meanwhile, I was wondering to myself, do we ask IBM lawyers permission or just do it? But it turned out to be a mood issue. Well, you don't ask permission. That's <laughs> in any case, one thing you learn is, like when I did home networks, you know, the networks you have at home, that was one thing I did when I was at Microsoft. And people said, you're allowed to do this. I'm not stupid enough to ask. <laughs> you know, and, and matter of fact, phone company said, no, you're not allowed to, but by then it was too late for them to, to stop it. Yes? So you said that you assembled it on the Multics machine, and you were doing this out of your attic. Yes. But how did you get the code from the Multics machine to your Apple's machine? Magic of the serial port. <laughs> we basically did the binary image and bring it in through the serial port. No, well, uh, I had a separate modem. I'm trying, again, you, you're asking memories. Um, I think it would ha we've had to basically a terminal program on the Apple II itself. Yes? I, uh, I worked on something where it was for Excel, which was compatible with 123, which was compatible with VisiCalc. Yes. I remember some oddity about date calculations. Oh, yeah, J Jonathan Sachs. Okay. The very first program I wrote in 1963 on the IBM 1620 calculated leap years. It was a loop by four and would check for the centuries. Now, it took five seconds between years. It's not exactly a fancy machine, couldn't do arithmetic, had tables. <coughs> But I knew about leap years. Jonathan Sachs did not. So he got it wrong. He, I think, decided 2000 was not a leap year. But the 400 rule says it is a leap year. 500 rule says it's not. 500? 500. There's another? Well, that's a long time. By the way, I can also give you the t things why leap seconds were an utterly idiotic idea. And if anybody knows an astronomer, yes. tell them. It is illegal to redefine the minute. You're 3,000 years too late. Go, you've destroyed every database in the world for the last 40 years. You should be ashamed and, and go apologize and undo it. So in the format, I forgot if zero was 1900, what, was the, what did zero date mean? Well, no, zero, uh, purposes, I think, we, uh, one of the lessons you learned, I think, is to start in March 1st, 1900, not January to avoid the first leap year problem. The, 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 the two reasons that if anyone enters a deed for something, you can't represent the date until earlier than that. Well, this is, there was, again, I don't know all the things. We didn't really have date calculations in VisiCalc, or did, I don't think we did. Uh, we had a date. I have to remember the date stuff, but I, we, we had to do. I don't think we did dates as such in Visicox, so we avoided it. The advanced version might have had dates. That's right. If it was, it may have been later. So it might have been the advanced version, but yes, I don't. I, I don't remember programming dates as such, but that would have taken another fifty bytes. <laughs> 
Oh, yeah, the different, and well, Malt, well, this goes back with Maltics, why it started, I think, Maltics was March 1st, 1901, for the, that, 1900, for that reason. So, you know, people don't appreciate in the 1960s how sophisticated some of this stuff, and the, the kids who did Unix didn't quite get all of this. Like, one of the features left out of Maltics was fancy piping, because we knew they would get it wrong, and in fact, they did. To this day, Unix pipes don't work. You put a space in a file name, and suddenly all your tools break. The which? The byte review you talk about here. Yes. Why did they, why did that? Because I told them they were going to be there, and oh, Carl yeah. liked uh, tr trick functions. I mean, I mean, I like Carl. I mean, again, these are people I still see. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, yes, lots. Of, I mean, I'm on head of graphs and all this stuff, the whole graphing facility. I, one thing we toyed with putting in was you could do a split screen. You could have graphics at the bottom and spread and text at the top. So I was thinking of putting real, real time graphing in. Maybe you know, if I had more room, I would have just gone bitmap mode. So, the, yes, all sorts of things. The trick was to really, what can you leave out? And leaving out things made it, you know, was an advantage. And one of the rules we had was if you can't explain. You know, if it's it, it, traditionally in programming these days, is the writers have to explain everything. Our rule was if you can't do it in the reference card, fix the program. The program is too complicated to explain, fix the program. So that we did do, but it was also a benefit to leave out all those fancy features. Um, one of the things we did put in was net present value, and that got people upset because apparently. We, we effectively redefined that present value for most people by starting with zero versus what COBOL did. Oh, I, the one other thing I put in was lookup. The lookup function, because I do my taxes. So I put in what I needed. <laughs>